Well, we've come to our second study tonight on Elijah the Forgotten Prophet. A double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And we've just read together of uh, what actually happened there in 2 Kings chapter 2. But let's, before we get to that, what actually happened between our last study, the history of our last study, and what we've just read tonight. In fact, there was a period of about 10 years uh, that really Elisha is only referred to as he that poured water on the hands of Elijah. So he was just a humble servant that uh, went around with Elijah for 10 years. Now, there's no record of what actually happened with the two of them at that time. He was just uh, learning from Elijah and with him for that period of 10 years. A couple of other things happened during that time period that Ahab, that wicked king that we've just been reading about in Chronicles, he died after the, uh, the death of Naboth. Remember, he was slain in the battle where a man drew a, an arrow at a venture and it smote him between the harness and he died in the chariot at the end of the day. And then Ahab was succeeded by his wicked son Ahaziah, who was really no better, and he reigned for two years and he fell down through the lattice and he was sick and he sent uh, for Elijah to find out what his fate would be. During that period of time, King Jehoshaphat of Judah joined in affinity with Ahab, with uh, ah Ahaziah, and uh, they jointly built ships at Ezon Geba, but they were destroyed, but of course they couldn't sail to, to uh, Tarshish, but that's where they intended to go. And of course God said to, uh, to Jehoshaphat that he should not have been uh, associated or in fellowship some, with somebody as evil as Ahab and Ahaziah his son. So those ships were destroyed and all this was going on in the background of that 10 year period. Elijah reappears during the reign of Ahaziah after Ahaziah had sent to Baalzebub the god of Ekron to inquire about his recovery from an accident. And Elijah came with, there were three groups of 50 men, you might remember, he came with the, the final group of 50 men to indict this wicked son of Ahab. And so Ahaziah was to die too. And so now the work of Elijah has come to an end. And the way is opened for Elisha to speak with the still small voice to the 7,000 who had not bowed the knee in Israel. Okay, just to put us, uh, uh, give us a bit of a snapshot where we are, uh, as far as chronology, here we are. Here's Elisha here. Uh, in fact, so Elisha picks up the work. There is an overlap here with Elijah. Elijah is taken away at this point, but he is still around somewhere, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So here is Elisha, and uh, he is contemporary with this king, Ahaziah, which you can just see down here. Very, he reigned for a very short period, two years, and uh, Elisha now commence, commences his work, as you can see there, with the school of the prophets. So we read here now in chapter 2 and verse 1. And it came to pass when Yahweh would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. So they moved down from Gilgal and then it tells us that they came to Bethel and then finally down to Jericho and across the Jordan where finally Elijah was taken up. You'll notice I've got on the screen there that it says he was taken up and the, my first picture showed a horse and chariots. In fact, the scriptures, we may not get to this tonight, the scriptures tell us he was taken up in a whirlwind. And we need to, uh, to uh, understand what that is saying. So when we get to that, I'll explain that to you. So here they were. They moved down. There's two Gilgals in the Bible, by the way. There's one just right next to Jericho, but we believe the one that they came from was the one you can see on the map. They came down from Jericho to Bethel, and then across, they came from Gilgal rather, down to Bethel and across to Jericho. So when we take the names of those three locations, Gilgal means a rolling away of the flesh, Bethel means the house of God, and Jericho means a place of fragrance. So if we paraphrase the three of those three names to go together, because there were ecclesias in these three locations. That's what they were doing. They were visiting, as they journeyed down to go across the Jordan River, they were visiting these ecclesias. And these were ecclesias that rolled away the reproach of Egypt and saw their responsibility as a house of God and exuded 
a fragrance of God's word. So in each of those ecclesias, there were the sons of the prophets. And the location of these three ecclesias was conducive to spiritual growth. It was close, as you can see on the screen there, to a Bible school which was at Ramah. Yes, they had Bible schools in the days of Elisha and Elijah. So let's just have a look at this passage in 1 Samuel 19 and verse 20. The background in 1 Samuel 19 verse 20, we've got David is fleeing from Saul for his life. And we pick it up in verse 18 of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 19. So David fled and escaped and came to Samuel to Ramah. So, so see on the map there, he came, that was right back, he came to Ramah and he told Samuel all that Saul had done to him and he and Samuel went and dwelt at Naoth. Now, the word Naoth in the margin of your Bibles, certainly is in the margin of my Bible, is the schoolhouse. So they went together to a schoolhouse. Now, we believe, brethren and sisters and young people, that this was a Bible school that was established here by David and Samuel all that time ago, a Bible school. It was the centre of the school of the prophets or the sons of the prophets. And I've got a number of quotations there. In fact, the last quotation is wrong. It should be uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, not verse 11. But all those are references to when Elisha went, he met there with the sons of the prophets. There was a congregation or a gathering at these, at, at, well, there were groups of uh, sons of the prophets, but they congregated at Ramah at the Bible school. Let's read on, verse 19, in uh, 1 Samuel 19. And it was told Saul, saying, Behold, David is at Naoth. He's at the schoolhouse in Ramah. And Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as appointed over them, the Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. And what that is saying is, look, you've got Samuel, and when it says that they were prophesying, they're not actually getting up in the front of people and saying, look, this is going to happen in the future, and this is going to happen in the future, it means that they were, they were studying the word of God together. That's what the word means. They were studying the word of God together. And Samuel was leading the study. But then Saul sent messages. You see, and so Saul's messages come into the Bible school. And what happens? Well, they're caught up in the whole... You know, you go to a wonderful Bible school, you get caught up in the spirit of the Bible school, you get lifted onto a high, and... You are on a, a spiritual plane. You are, your thoughts are much higher. That's what happened to these men. They also prophesied. They were infected by the enthusiasm in the Bible school. And verse 21, And when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. So they come to the Bible school, and they got caught up in the spirit of the Bible school, and they started to read their Bibles and to study their Bibles. And Saul sent messengers again, and the third time, and they prophesied also. So what happens? Saul decides to go himself. Then went he up to Ramah and came to a great well that is in Siku. And he asked and he said, where are Samuel and David? And one said, well, behold, they're at the Bible school in Naoth, or in Ramah. Ra Naoth in Ramah, that's where they are. And, he, and Saul went thither to Naoth in Ramah and the Spirit of God came upon him. Now, it doesn't mean that God poured the Holy Spirit upon Saul. It means the, the effects of, the, of the, the environment, the spirit word, affected Saul. It affected his thinking. And he stripped off his clothes, verse 24. Now, it doesn't mean he took all his clothes off. It means he took off his kingly garments, because in the margin of my Bible, it's got there his, his royal, his armour and his royal vestments. He took those off, and he was just dressed like everybody else. So he, he was brought down to the same level of everybody else. And he prophesied before Samuel. So the spirit of this Bible school even affected Saul. It didn't last. In like manner also, and he lay down like that, not naked, but with, with, without his uh, royal robes on, all that day and all that night. Wherefore they say, well, look, is Saul also amongst the prophets? Is Saul really one of those people who goes to the Bible school? That's what they were saying. And so this was the Bible school that was established by David and Samuel 
and we come right through to the time of Elisha now and that we've still got these, this Bible school still going. Now, let's just have a closer look at this. Um, First Chronicles chapter 9. Let's go across to First Chronicles chapter 9. First Chronicles chapter 9 just tells us how David and Samuel organised all of the arrangements to, for the Bible school and for the ecclesial environment in his day. First Chronicles chapter 9, verse uh, 22. All these were chosen to be porters in the gates, were 212. They were reckoned by the genealogy in their villages. And here's the point. Whom David and Samuel, the seer, did ordain in their set office. So that means they did ordain. They, David and Samuel got their heads together. They said, and this is the time when Saul was making life very difficult for David. They got their heads together and said, well, we need to arrange ecclesial life. We need to have porters. We need to have doormen. Verse 23, so they and their children had the oversight of the gates of the house of Yahweh, namely the house of the tabernacle by wards. And, of course, if you read on through the rest of this chapter, which we're not going to do, but you can see on the screen there, there were store managers, treasurers, those who looked after the vessels, the overseers of vessels, there were apocryphies, there were metal workers, bakers and singers and so forth. Everybody was appointed, as we have in ecclesial life today. We all have got various roles which we fulfil in ecclesial life. But what the point we're making is that all of this was established, Bible school, and organised ecclesial life by Samuel and David right back in their time. And it was carried on right through to the time of the sons of the prophets. That's what the sons of the prophets were doing. They were in these Bible schools, in these ecclesias, in an organised manner. And that's what we're reading about there in Second Kings. So let's come back to Second Kings now. Second Kings chapter 2. And of course it then says you've got verse 2. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for Yahweh has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As Yahweh liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. Verse 3. And the sons of the prophets. Here's the, the brethren and sisters, if you like, or these are the the ones who were studying their Bibles, the ones at the Bible schools, the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that Yahweh will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. So Elijah knew what was going to happen and, and somehow or other the word must have gotten out. They all knew. And they were wondering now, well, who is going to be his successor? Who is going to be the one to lead the schools of the prophets? Did these 50 men think that one of them should have been Elijah's successor? You know, just to think about it, our ecclesia is an ecclesia of about 110 brethren and sisters. We've got seven arranging brethren. Here's 50 men. They would have been the prominent uh, brethren of that, that ecclesial environment there. So quite a large congregation, probably a 1,000, quite, quite a large congregation. But 50 of them said, look, who's going to be the successor? Now, maybe they thought one of them should have been the successor to Elijah. And so they asked the question. But you see, Elisha was God's choice. He wasn't even Elijah's choice. He wasn't even one of the sons of the prophets. He came from a wealthy farm, remember that? He didn't belong to, the, to the, the sons of the prophets. Now, all of the sons of the prophets would have thought, well, the person who's going to get this job with Elijah really has to be somebody who who knows his Bible and studied, well, that's true, you'd have to know his Bible, but he studied with us and belongs to one of us. Well, it wasn't to be the case. Here he was. He came from a prosperous family with estates and servants, so he's probably different to a lot of the other ones, and he certainly was different to Elijah. And, you know, it's a lesson for us, brethren and sisters. If we were to choose our successes in life, and if we were to choose who we work with in ecclesial life, uh, maybe... We wouldn't choose the brethren and sisters that we work with. God arranges the circumstances for us that we would need to work together uh, no matter who he is appointed to work with us. We must accept God's choices. As iron sharpens iron, we must accept differences. We're all different. And perhaps we would not have chosen some brothers and sisters as companions if we were not in the truth. But God has brought us all together on the basis of the word. God has done it. 
We don't do it. And as we understand from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul shows that the body, the ecclesial body, is made up of a diverse range of brothers and sisters. And so perhaps Elisha was a surprise nomination for Elijah's successor. They didn't know who it was going to be. And so we, when we read that the two of them went on in verse 7, they come down to Jericho, and they stand in verse 7, and 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood. They waited to see just what was going to happen, and they too stood by Jordan. So now here is Elisha and Elijah standing by the banks of the river Jordan. And of course we know the passage of scripture that says the testimony of two men is true. So here were two men, but only one was going to come back. And of course when we read on a little bit later we find out that Elisha did have another servant with him and that was Gehazi. Perhaps not a very fitting servant, but one that was a companion for him. So when we read in scripture we nearly always seem to find brethren working in pairs. And even the apostles were men of diverse Diverse temperaments, characters and occupations and yet they went out in two by twos. And so here they were by the banks of the Jordan River. And we know that John the Baptist, who was typed by Elijah, was to diminish, to make way for the Lord and here Elijah was to diminish, to make way for Elisha. And so we're told in verse 8, and Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither so that they too went over on dry ground. You can see on the screen there I've got the word mantle. He took his mantle. The word mantle is that Hebrew word there which means goodly, ample or magnificent. Now the only other place that is translated in the scriptures is in Zechariah chapter 11. I want you to come with me to Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 13. In Zechariah chapter 11, it's talking about the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 12. And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price. And if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. You know, it's a prophecy about the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Yahweh said unto me, Cast it unto the potter a goodly price. That word goodly is the same word as mantle in Second Kings. A goodly price that I was prized out of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of Yahweh. So as you can see on the screen, uh, it ref I believe it refers to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and this mantle now that he smote the waters with refers to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's just unfold this a little bit more. We're told back in 2 Kings chapter 2, that he wrapped this mantle together. So you can see on the screen there the word wrap means as an embryo. The, where I've got T-W-O-T, -T, that mean, means the theological word book of the Old Testament. According to the theological word book of the Old Testament, it means a substance yet being unperfect. That's what an embryo is. An embryo is, is a, like a, a baby that's just starting to develop in the womb of its mother. The only other place that this word is rendered in the scriptures is in Psalm 139, verse 16. I want you to come there because there it refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 139, verse 13. A prophecy concerning the Lord Jesus Christ's conception and development in the womb. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was, when I was made in secret, 
and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance being yet unperfect. And you can see if you look at the screen, those words there, substance being yet unperfect is the word for embryo. It's the same word as wrapped in Second Kings chapter 2. So here in Psalm 139, it's a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ that is by the power of the Holy Spirit being born of a woman, being, being conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, but he was born of a woman, but he was curiously wrought. His substance was yet unperfect in thy book. All my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. So it's a prophecy about the conception the special conception of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we come back to Second Kings chapter 2 and we, we say, all right, if that's what that word means, if this wrapped up mantle that refers to also the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the goodly price of the Lord Jesus Christ, then it's telling us that this work of the Lord Jesus Christ was just in an embryo stage. It really hadn't fully developed. And so what was happening here, the dividing of the Jordan River is just in an embryo stage. So I've got on the screen here that Elijah's work, really the national salvation of Israel, was yet to continue in the future. See, Elijah was taken off the scene, but Elijah is to be brought back again. So for Elijah, this was just an embryo. It was just the very beginning of his work. But also it speaks of salvation that comes to the turning around of this the flow of this water in the Jordan River which we'll come to in a moment the word smote he smote it there in 2nd Kings chapter 2 and uh, verse 8 and they were and he wrapped it together and smote the water the word the words used in in Psalm 1 in Psalm 50 in Isaiah 53 rather uh, when it refers to the Lord Jesus Christ being smitten of God's referring to his crucifixion now you might be thinking brethren and sisters well look you know Neville's taking these things and he's stretching them I'm only telling you what the scriptures are saying this is what brother Thomas says about types he says it is a mode of instruction more calculated to keep up the attention and to impress the mind permanently than a set discourse or a formal disposition the scriptures are constructed after this ingenious plan by which they are made so much more interesting and capable of containing so much more matter than any book of the same subject and of the same size. And anybody who's a, a, a reader of Brother Thomas's works will understand that, that he will take a passage of scripture, explore it and open up the types and then reinforce that with scripture. That's what we've done a little bit here. And then we're going to take that a little bit further as we now look at this Jordan River. We can read the narrative and say, well, look, that's a very interesting story. Or we can look deeper and find out just what is it telling us. So what we've got here, they're, they're crossing the Jordan River. Now, that takes us right back to the first crossing of the Jordan under Joshua. Remember that? Joshua, Israel coming into the Promised Land, they crossed the Jordan River. <coughs> under Joshua, as a type of Christ, the waters back up to Adam. And we're going to look at that. And they symbolically stop the descent from life to death. But under Elijah and Elisha, the waters are only divided. They're not backed up to Adam. The work, that's the work of, of Elijah and Elisha co couldn't stem the continuous flow from life to death. Only the work of the Lord Jesus Christ can do that. So even though the waters were divided... They were not able to back the waters up as Joshua was able to. Let's just go back and have a, a little bit of a look at this in Joshua chapter 3 when Israel came into the promised land. Now I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the Jordan River for a couple of reasons. Because you've got Naaman who was baptised in the Jordan. We've got other incidents that occur in the Jordan River. So we need to establish some principles of this first crossing now at the Jordan River. So Joshua chapter 3 which is the children of Israel coming into the land of promise and crossing that river. Now it tells us, not in Joshua chapter 3, or in Joshua chapter 3, uh, we read verse 1, And Joshua rose early in the morning 
and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan. He and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. Now, if you look at my screen, Numbers 33 tells us that the place was really called Abel Shittim. Here Joshua refers to it just as Shittim. It tells us in Numbers 33 that when they pitched, they pitched their tents, they pitched from Beth Jeshimoth to Abel Shittim. So the tents stretched right out between those two places. Now Beth Jesimosh means the house of desolation and Abel Shittim means the morning of the acacias. So this is the region just here on the map. This is where and there are these two areas and their tents spread across those two areas. They encamped there just before they came into the land of promise. From Beth Jeshimoth to Abel Shittim. The spread of Israel's tents was from Abel Shittim which means the morning of the acacias, to signify the morning on the account of the plague wrought because of the sin with the daughters of Moab. Remember the daughters of Moab came and seduced many of the men of, of Israel. But they also pitched right through to Beth Jeshimoth, which means house of desolation. And that was to remind them of their sin, a sober reminder of their past, and now they are going to leave that behind them it's like when we come into the waters of baptism, we leave all our life, our past life behind us. They're going to leave all those mistakes, all those dreadful sins behind them, and now they're going to pass through the Jordan and come into the land of promise. So the crossing of the Jordan was a type of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ as he crossed through the divide of death to life eternal. We're told that Joshua rose early in the morning here in verse 1. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ rose early in the morning after three days. The ark that was previously in the midst of Israel was now brought up to the front. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is our head and our leader to lead us through, the first one through this river. We're told that the Levites bore the ark aloft, as you can see on the, the screen there, on their shoulders. And they stood in the midst of the, in the, street, in the river as the waters divided. It tells us uh, in verse 2, And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of Yahweh your God, and the priests and the Levites bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, of about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go, for ye have not passed the way heretofore. So there was to be a space between the people and the ark of about 2,000, not exactly, about 2,000 cubits. As you can see on the screen there, that word, is the word space, can be translated a great while to come. It's the same word that's used in, in the promises in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7 where it says that God's uh, house would be in a great while to come well that's what that word space means so it, it seems to be a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ crossed over from life to death we have now gone 2,000 years from that and our salvation we will follow in the same way about 2,000 years afterwards They had to pass over the Jordan River, which was in flood. And so like Abraham, they and us have to pass over the barrier between us and our inheritance. Now the Jordan River, you can see a picture of the Jordan River. It looks like a serpent and all the lush growth around the, the Jordan River. It's referred to, its name means the descender. And it descends from the, the springs of the freshwater springs of Mount Hermon, beautiful clear water, all the way down like a snake or a serpent, all the way down to the Dead Sea. So it's a typical, uh, it's a type of, of mortality of all mankind's life. Starts at a very fresh spring as a baby and then after the very torturous course of life ends up in death. 
And so they were told they had to stand in that river and stand still. And of course it's teaching the lesson that they were in the flesh, they were in that, that, that life's way that takes us to death. We must try to be inactive in it. Of course there's another principle that comes out of this too and it's something that you may not have heard of in the Bible. It's known as the covenant of the foot. You know, Abraham was told to arise and to walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it. Here they were to use their feet and to stand in the river. Moses was told to take off his shoes. Their shoes didn't wear out in the wilderness. Our feet must be shod with the gospel of salvation. And of course, John the Baptist said he wasn't worthy to loose the shoe latch of the shoe of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of it speaks of our walk, our walk with shoes that are fitting in the way to the kingdom of God. But that walk takes us through the Jordan. It tells us in verse 13 of Joshua chapter 3, And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of Yahweh, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand up upon a heap. So you can just imagine that the water stopped, and then they stand up on a heap. And of course the principle it's teaching is that by one man, Adam, death has come to all men. All men all get to death, and they all just build up in the grave. They'll mound up in a heap from Adam. Their life is stopped. That's what it's teaching. Now Israel crossed over. In verse 15 we read, And they that bear the ark were come unto the Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the Jordan, for the Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest. So it's not just some little trickle of water. It's a raging torrent like on the screen here. They've got to cross through this. They've got to have enough faith that the, the uh, priests have got to go out into this water and they had to cross over into the land of promise when the river was a raging torrent. Of course, it, it's teaching the, the principle that Israel crossed over at a time when the flesh was at its height. You know, we're told that God would bring them in when the, when the wickedness of the Amorites was at its height. When the world was at its worst... God said, God said to Abraham, I'm going to bring your seed back into the land when the wickedness of the Amorites is full. And he's also telling us, brethren, sisters and young people, that he's going to bring us into the land when the wickedness of the world is full. And it really couldn't get much fuller than it is today. We're living at a time when the banks of that Jordan are really overflowing. The, the banks are full. It goes on to say in verse 16, that the waters which came down from above stood up and rose up upon a heap very far from the city Adam that is beside Zaratan. And those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off, so no more water run into the Dead Sea. And the people passed over right against Jericho. So as you can see, the waters were pushed up right up to Adam. I mean, the, the Bible is telling us quite clearly that this type really fits. The flow from Adam to death has been stopped and the waters have heaped up at Adam. That's what it's saying. It says, the city that is beside Zaratan. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ was pierced in his side that the flow from life to death might be stopped. The word Zaratan comes from the Hebrew to pierce. And Zaratan, as you can see on the screen, was a place that was plentiful for clay. And of course, that's what we're made out of. We're made out of the, clay, the earth of the ground. Clay is a symbol of, of man. So here's this wonderful type in Joshua chapter 3 of the waters uh, being pushed back up to Adam. But in the kingdom of God, that's what's happening now. Those waters are still flowing all the way down to the Dead Sea. When the, when the priests went through the water, they stopped the flow, but it's still flowing again today but in the kingdom of God we're told that that's going to be reversed when the temple is constructed here this is the Dead Sea here we're told in these passages in Ezekiel 47 and Zechariah chapter 14 then said unto me these waters issue out toward the east country and go down into the desert and go into the sea which being brought forth into the sea the waters shall be healed 
the Dead Sea will be healed. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live, whether the river cometh. So previously the waters would flow down here, into the Dead Sea. But now in the kingdom of God, the flow is going to flow out of the temple, two rivers out of the temple, into the here. The water's then going to flow out here and then flow back out into the Mediterranean. The, the flow will be reversed. The principle of life will be reversed in the kingdom of God the, through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that uh, principle we have seen there uh, in Joshua chapter 3. So from life to death, originally this part of the world, the, the area around the Dead Sea, Sodom and Gomorrah, was, it was the Garden of Eden, but it was polluted by the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. And as a result, those two cities were blasted from the face of the earth. And from that point on, this region of Jordan became a symbol of all that was unclean and that which divides from the righteousness of God. It's another passage that concerns the Jordan and we need to understand this in relation to Naaman a little bit later on. I want you to come to this one in Jeremiah chapter 12. Still talking about the Jordan. Now in Jeremiah chapter 12, Jeremiah is finding life very difficult. And in a way, he's complaining to God. He's saying, look, I'm finding a pleasure life too difficult. And God says to Jeremiah, verse 5, chapter 12, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with the horses? And if in the land of peace wherein thou trustest they wearied thee, how then wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? Jeremiah, chapter 12, verse 5. So he said, look, Jeremiah, you, in a time of peace, you've had trouble contending with... you become weary in running with the footmen. You've had trouble in contending with horses. In a land of peace, wherein thou trusted, they, you were weary, you were upset, you were finding life very difficult. How wilt thou then do in the swelling of Jordan? Now, what's he saying? How wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? Well, the word swelling of Jordan really means the pride of Jordan. And it's a reference to the lush growth on either side of the Jordan River. So you can see that picture there. On either side of the Jordan River, very lush growth. The greenery that grows along the banks of the Jordan is very deceptive because it's, underneath that's oozy mud, there's vipers, there's wild boars, there's ferocious lions. So to get to this river, you've got to go through all of that. Okay, it's really typical of our life in the flesh, which every man and every woman must face and cross before he enters the land of promise. Now, if you're finding life difficult out there in the world, brethren and sisters, it's because you're going through the pride of Jordan. We must cross through the pride of Jordan. It was fitting that at this region should, it should witness the baptism of the Son of God, who stood in the muddy waters of the Jordan to fulfil all righteousness, confirming that all flesh is grass. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about this later with Naaman because Naaman had to come down to the banks of the Jordan and humble himself, go through all those difficulties before he could be baptised. And God's saying to Jeremiah, look Jeremiah, life is going to be difficult but you have to put your trust and confidence in me. Life will not be easy. How will you do in the swelling of Jordan? How will you do when you have to get into all that oozy mud, the vipers, the undergrowth, the ferocious lions, the boars, or all those people out there in the world that make life difficult. That's what it's going to be like for you, Jeremiah. And so, coming back to 2 Kings, brothers and sisters and young people, coming back to 2 Kings chapter 2. Here in 2 Kings chapter 2, we've got two crossings. We've got Elisha and Elijah cross over, and then... Elijah's taken up into heaven and, Elijah co and Elisha comes back and there's a second crossing. And so it is. There's, there's two crossings, as it were. There's two parts to getting into the kingdom of God. There's a mental and moral change 
our thinking, our way of life, but when, um, if that's acceptable at the judgment seat, then we'll be given a change of nature. So there's two parts that will happen. And there'll be two occasions when they will cross over from life to death, at the beginning of the millennium, at the end of the millennium. So we've got two crossings here with uh, Elisha and Elijah uh, in 2 Kings chapter 2. And so here they were, these 50 men in verse 7 of, of 2 Kings chapter 2. As I mentioned previously, they stood there and they viewed afar off just to see what happened. And as we say, that 50 represents quite a, a group of strong men. And so now Elisha asks the question in verse 9, and it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elijah said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Now he didn't ask for power as such or wealth. He asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Now that really symbolises a, a double portion, a double blessing is the blessing of the firstborn. He wanted to be marked out as one of God's firstborn sons. As you can see there, in, and we won't turn to the passage in Deuteronomy 21, a double portion was always, always reserved for the firstborn son. So Elisha, as a type of the firstborn son of God, who was given the spirit without measure that he might glorify his father, he typed the Lord Jesus Christ. And it appears that Elisha performed exactly double the number of miracles that Elijah performed. Now here's Elijah's miracles, eight miracles. Shutting of heaven, there'd be no rain, there would be a famine. Oil multiplied for the poor woman. The widow's son raised. Fire called down from heaven on Ahaziah's 50 men. Rain from heaven. <clears throat> Fire on the second 50. Oh, sorry, uh, number four fire from heaven is at um, uh, Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal. Five is when God caused the rain to appear like a little fist in the, and then it ended the drought. And then fire on the fifth, 50, fire on the second 50 and this one here, the parting of Jordan. So eight miracles by Elijah. But when we take Elisha, he has 16 miracles. We've got the Jordan parting in the same chapter. We've got, in the end of this chapter, the water's healed. We've got two bears that come out of the wood and slay 42 children or young men. We've got water for kings. We've got oil for the widow. We've got the gift of a, of a son for the widow. We've got the raising of the son from death. We've got the healing of the pottage. We've got bread multiplied, Naaman healed, Gehazi smitten, iron swimming, sight to the blind Syrian soldiers and then smiting them with blindness again and then the people in Samaria saved from famine and finally life out of death when a body touches, a dead body touches the bones of Elisha. So 16 miracles, a double portion, he's performed 16 miracles. Now, I don't know how far we'll get, we're not going to get through 16 studies, but uh, it's quite interesting to look at some of these. What do they mean? Very interesting lessons. So here they are now. They've, they've coming to the... He's asked for the double portion. And verse 10, he says, he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing, Elijah said. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold... And the words there appeared are not in the original. Behold, a chariot of fire and horses of fire and part of them both asunder and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So here they are. They're walking and they're talking. They're now walking and talking about the things of the truth. But of course it's saying to us that two can only walk together and talk together if they be agreed. And so here were these two men now agreed with the things of the truth. Now it says here, he was taken up by a chariot of fire. As you can see on the screen, the word chariot is the word Hebrew word, rechab, which means a vehicle to ride on. Rechab, it's a vehicle to ride. And the word cherubim 
is derived from this same word. And so, for example, we find in 1 Chronicles 28, 18, an expression, the chariots of the cherubim. So what it's really saying is it's not so much, like I've got a, there's a picture of the chariot on the, on the screen there. It's not really a chariot as such. It's a vehicle that carries the Spirit of God. That's what he saw, something that was a manifestation of God's power. In Scripture, it was always used as a symbol of divine power and protection. Just have a look at these in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24. This is the Rekeb. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. Of course, Adam and Eve have been driven out of the garden, verse 24. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Whatever it was, now of course we believe that what God placed there was angels. Angels were the power that God's spirit and power was manifest in. He placed angels with a flaming sword. The cherubim was not some grotesque, ugly creature that you couldn't look at. It's a symbol of the power of God. And so he placed angels, to notice they turned every way, to keep the way of the tree of life. And what that's telling us, brethren and sisters and young people, is that the angels that are in the room here tonight with us, are, they're doing the same thing. They're keeping the way of the God's way open to the tree of life. Providentially, they're working in our lives and they're guarding things, organising the, the events of this world by the power of God. That's the cherubim. That's what they're doing. That's what the angels are doing and that's what that means. They were there in the Garden of Eden and here they were involved in a line to being taken up and they're here in the room with us tonight but we can't see them. The difference is here was an open manifestation of that power. They watched over Elisha. Come to 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 17. And God willing, this will be a study that we will get to. 2 Kings chapter 6. Here you've got the situation where Elisha is surrounded. They're surrounded by the Syrian army. And Elisha's young servant says, what are we going to do? You know, we're going to, we can't get out. We can't survive. And verse 17 2 Kings 6, verse 17. And Elisha prayed and said, Yahweh, I pray thee, open his eyes. You know, our eyes are closed to the angels about us at the moment. Open his eyes that he may see. And Yahweh opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Well, not literally horses and chariots. But he saw the angels in a fiery manifestation. Now, those angels are here with us tonight. We just can't see them in a fiery manifestation, but here they were. Elisha saw them and, and his young servant did. And, of course, uh, Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 8, which is a prophecy of, of, of us that we will be involved in these ones here in Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk 3 and verse 8. <clears throat> I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction. So here's, here's the work of the rainbow angel now. That's us with the Lord Jesus Christ humbling the Arab nations that, that are a problem. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction and the curtains, referring to the tents, of the land of Midian did tremble. Was Yahweh displeased against the rivers, against the nations? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea, that thou didst ride upon thy horses and thy chariots of salvation? That's us. That's the, that's the saints manifesting the spirit and power of God and bringing God's judgments upon the nations. So we'll be like a whirlwind of fire. So that's what he saw when we come back to Second Kings chapter six, uh, two rather. Second Kings chapter two, he saw a rakeb of fire and of and horses of fire. We're told that he went up by a whirlwind. Now, that picture is not necessarily correct. It's probably 
We don't know, but probably more like that. In fact, it's the same word. The word whirlwind, he went up by a whirlwind, it's the same word that you can see on the screen that's used in Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 4, where it says, And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof, as the colour of amber, out of the midst of the fire. So he saw this great whirlwind of fire, and Elijah was taken up by this power into heaven. So he didn't see horses and chariots as such. It was the manifestation of the power of, uh, of God. So what happened to this whirlwind? What happened to this chariot? Well, we've already seen in 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 17, they were still there, but th th their eyes were closed. They just couldn't see them. And they were with Elijah, Elisha right to the time of his falling asleep. 2 Kings 13 verse 14. 2 Kings 13, verse 14. <clears throat> now, this is when Elisha was about to die. Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness, whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he's saying, look, I see you, Elisha, really as that vehicle in which God's spirit and God's power works through. You are really the manifestation of that whirlwind. And so the king of Israel could refer to Elisha as the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Now, brethren and sisters, it's, um, it's 8.30. I've been going for about an hour. Uh, I, won't, I haven't quite finished this study. But I will leave the rest of it, God willing, because uh, you know, we, you'll lose your concentration if I keep on going. And uh, I think this is a good place to leave it. We'll then come back and just tidy this up, and then we'll move on to the next two smaller prophecies, which uh, finish off Second Kings chapter 2, uh, God willing, in our next class. So let's just take that thought with us, though, that we are surrounded by the spirit and power of God. And one day our eyes are going to be opened. And we will see that power. We will, in fact, be manifestations of it also. But there was Elijah. He was taken away. He wasn't taken to heaven. He was still on the earth. And now Elisha was bestowed uh, with this power and this responsibility. So God willing, we will now go with him in, in the next fortnight to see some amazing miracles that he does perform. So thank you.